please welcome Chrysula Weinegar, Lonnie Ali, Nina Ansari, and Connie Britton. I am so honored to be here with these amazing women who are so inspiring. We're here to talk about the idea of being heard. So I'd like to ask each of you before we get dive into the details, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to be heard? Connie, we'll start with you. Well, um, you know, it means so many different things, both simple and complex, but, uh, you know, to me, the most fundamental part of being heard is first knowing yourself and having the courage to really look inside and say, this is who I am. This may not be who you are, this is who I am. And now I'm going to have the courage to, to use my voice and to uh, represent myself in the world and to fight for what's important to me. And uh, to me, that's, that's at the most fundamental level of being heard. Lonnie? Well, for me, being heard is, um having an opportunity to be, to do good in the world and to be heard uh, about what I'm doing and, and an opportunity to tell people and to be validated with that. Um, interestingly enough, I am, um, you know, here with, uh, you know, making this voice and hopefully the platform that I'm being given will, will allow me to be heard on a larger scale as well. Nina. For me, being heard is really not about my voice, but it's about giving uh, oppressed women who don't have the capacity to speak or be heard a voice on the outside. So it's not so much about me being heard as for me being a mouthpiece for women in an oppressive patriarchal society that are aching to be heard. So Connie, you've, you've taken this concept that Nina has just articulated and you've used your professional success to raise your voice. As you have traveled both personally and in your role with UNDP, what are some of the stories that you've observed and, and, and been able to amplify? Well, you know, when I, and when I was speaking about it, it, it it's, it's also really about uh, what I have the opportunity to do in my work is to set an example for people who may not know that they can actually have a voice and to, to, to set an example that you can do it. And you can, you, if somebody's telling you you can't, actually you can. And if someone is telling you that your voice isn't important, actually it is. And you know, I, I'm extremely fortunate because I have a platform in the roles that I play to, uh, to demonstrate women who are um, being courageous and using their voices. And I, I, my hope always when I do that is that girls and women feel inspired and uh, emboldened to use their voice. And, and I also, because I get to work with the UNDP as a goodwill ambassador, uh, get to see a much broader uh, spectrum of women who um, are desperate to know their own voices and the power of their own voices. And I have seen story upon story upon story of how communities are changed and lives are changed and families are changed when women are given a little bit of support and a little bit of encouragement to, uh, to be strong and to know their power and to not be threatened by the, by the world around them. Uh, to do that, and um, so you know, in my world, I, I've been able to see it both here at home and abroad, and I see the impact that we can make in the world when we have when we know our voices. So this is something that that has been sitting with all of us as we've been talking together. Nina, I want you to start us off. Some of the women that you have learned about and, mm -hmm. and met with from Iran, or the, the stories that you're hearing. Mm -hmm. What happens when the barriers to their empowerment in Iran and other countries are broken down? Like, what are we, what are we missing out on? What's the potential of, of, of unlocking women around the world? Well, the biggest uh, mode, of, mode of empowerment for women currently in Iran has been their education. Um, that education has fueled the, and empowered them to break down at least some of the barriers. It's a, not an overnight um, process. It's a 
very one small step, step at a time process. Uh, the most important thing that is that women in Iran are not bending to the patriarchal boundaries. Uh, they do not view them as impediments. They uh, find ways to navigate around them. One of the biggest uh, ways for women to maintain their autonomy is not getting married, not having children. Uh, you know, it's one small step at a time for these women, but the most important thing is for these women to feel that they are supported. Uh, so the mindset not only needs to be altered, but what's important is that this new generation in Iran, a lot of the men um, are also supportive of women. For example, a point of contention right now, one of uh, the many points of contention is the mandatory veil. Uh, recently, men came out in support of their wives, mothers, sisters, in solidarity, and were taking photographs with female members of their family wearing the veil as men. So that was uh, a beautiful uh, image to see that, uh, and also makes you uh, have hope that there are men out there that don't replicate the ruling regime. And there are many of them. <laughs> Lonnie, your entire experience with your husband, Muhammad, has been about co-sharing your voices in a way and, and collaborating together at, at different stages of, of your strengths and your, and your talents. Correct. Yeah, f uh, because of Muhammad's illness, his, you know, he was always known as being very loquacious and always having a voice and speaking up for a lot of different issues, social issues, um, trying to uplift people. And I knew when I married Muhammad that that too would become part of what I would be doing, would be to supporting him in that effort. And as long as he had his voice, we did share that voice together. But as his voice softened, as he got older and the, and the disease progressed, I became that voice. And I was fortunate enough to have that support from Muhammad to do that, to go forward and represent the things that he believed in, that we both believed in and shared. And he was very much about women being coming educated and being out in the world. It's what he wanted for his daughters. He always um, would go into the classrooms and talk about education and people getting educated, women included. And so I was fortunate to be able to share that time with him and be given that platform and that, that entrance into a lot of different societies and, and th that path to do, to do that. So I you know, have been fortunate in that way, but it was a shared collaboration, absolutely. And that's the power of it because it's sustainable when we do this together. Mm -hmm. um, Connie, women are disproportionately affected by poverty. In terms of your experiences, what, what are you learning that the keys are to shifting that imbalance? Well, to me, um, when I see that, uh, you know, 60% of uh, the population of people who are chronically hungry and impoverished are women and girls, that says to me, that is an untapped resource in the world. If these people are being hung are held down and being hungry and living in poverty, they if they were given a little bit of help and a little bit of support, they could lift themselves up and be an immense force, economic and otherwise, in the world. And, um, you know, I think that that is something that's such a key issue. You know, we, t we do talk a lot about it to the point where it becomes a little cliche talking about gender equality and female empowerment and all that. But if you really look at it from just the basic platform of letting women be strong, literally letting them not be hungry, letting them not be overworked, letting them get a fair wage for the work that they're doing, it's, it's very simple that that translates to a workforce, that translates to uh, a resource that will be available in the world. And that, I think, is the number one way that we can start to truly eradicate poverty around the world. Nina, what are you seeing that you're excited about? Is there are some shifts, some real shifts for women in, your, in the Iranian community and in broadly around the world. Well, for women in Iran, there, there um, have been some strides due to their activism over the years. Uh, unfortunately, um, what I term the Islamic Republic's war on women continues. Uh, in fact, uh, what's disappointing, most disappointing, is that the uh, current president that ran under a moderate banner and actually uh, women rallied to support him simply because of his uh, 
campaign slogans saying that women should enjoy equal opportunities. There has been very little movement with regards to implementing progressive gender policies. In fact, the uh, Rouhani government has remained silent in the face of uh, harassment and atrocities taken out against women's rights activists. Uh, women's rights activists have actually suffered uh, the harshest penalties during this uh, presidential period, uh, serving uh, harsh sentences for their peaceful activism. Uh, so what's difficult uh, is that uh, despite a highly educated female population, uh, there are still many hurdles and obstacles that remain on the horizon. So when we can unlock this potential that we know exists and is so unbelievably massive, what do we do with it? What do we do about it? What does that look like? What does that mean? Well, I think women, as, as both of my co-panelists have said, have a voice. And I think education is, is truly a path to women strengthening that voice and finding their voice. A path to action, I think, would be, for instance, what I'm doing um, it, it's still in trying to promote Muhammad's voice and his legacy with the Ali 75 initiative of bringing that to a global stage and, and um, for good, to do good for other people, which is what he stood for. So I think people will have to find their, women have to find their own path, they have to find their own voice and, um, um, you know, hopefully do something that is good with that voice to not only help themselves and, and the causes they believe in, but also to empower others. My friends, give us a final call to action. Give our, each of you, if you could give a marching order of what you want to see this community do next. Nina, we'll start with you. Well, what's very important is for the international community uh, to rally and give uh, not only women in Iran, but women in any society that simply seeks to restrain and debilitate and denigrate women strictly based on their gender. Uh, it's very important for everybody to come together, not just me as a woman who was born in Iran and left uh, 38 years ago to sit here and give my uh, sisters in Iran a voice. I think it's important for men and women in various sectors uh, to come together and not only voice, uh, give a voice to women in oppressive societies, give a voice to any kind of oppression that's going on. I think. Uh, given the power of social media, given the borderless nature of social media, we can do that. Lonnie, call us to action. Well, my call to action to people would be to do one good thing for someone else uh, every day. Um, whether it's giving women a voice uh, for maybe the males out there to think differently about women and their abilities and what they can accomplish if given that voice. Um, that would be my call to action. Yeah, I love that. And I would just add to that, um, to, uh, to my call to action would be to the women out there to know that if you use your voice, you can make change. And to the men out there, that if you let your woman use her voice to make change, <laughs> it will make you stronger, and that we will together be stronger if we know that as we work together, we, will, uh, we can empower each other. So as we uh, be heard ourselves and we enable others to be heard, and then also to Lonnie's point, we go out and serve and give back to others, then we can unleash something extraordinary in all of us, men and women together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Engagement Manager for the United Nations Development.